tonight to our first Senate District Special Election Candidate Forum. Thank you candidates for coming out tonight as well. I'm here to introduce our moderator for tonight. His name is Jonathan Anderson, and he's a reporter with the Green Bay Press Gazette. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, uh, thanks, Robert. Um, it's great to see that so many people are interested in uh, this special election. Um, we're really happy that you're here. It's an important discussion, um, which um, is also being broadcast um, on Facebook and uh, on the Green Bay Press Gazette's website. Uh, we'll begin momentarily, uh, but first I want to briefly go over the plan for the next hour. Uh, we have the two candidates uh, in the first Senate District special election, uh, Democrat Caleb Frostman and Republican Andre Jacques. Uh, both of those candidates will have three minutes to make opening remarks, and then we'll get right to the questions. Um, and while we've got some questions prepared for you, um, my hope is that most of the questions tonight uh, will come from members of the audience and from viewers on Facebook. Uh, audience members with a question should fill out a question form and bring it to editor Carl Ebert, who is uh, right here. Uh, and Facebook viewers should post their questions in the video's comment section uh, on Facebook. And another editor, Pete Frank down here, will take those questions and read them off. All right, we probably won't be able to get to every question that you have, um, but we will do our best to take as many as we can. Uh, each candidate will have up to two minutes to answer each question, and if there is an attack, which we are defining as when a candidate makes a statement or claim about the opposing candidate, uh, the target of the attack can request 30 minutes, excuse me, 30 seconds to respond, uh, 30 seconds to be clear. Uh, and Robert, another one of our editors who introduced me, will be down here uh, keeping time. Lastly, for members of the audience, uh, we're really glad that you're here, um, but we ask that you refrain from cheering or jeering, and that you hold applause until the very end. Uh, so with that, we'll get going. We flipped a coin to determine who would start first with opening statements, and uh, Caleb, the coin toss determined you would start, so you've got three minutes for an uh, opening statement. All right, thank you, Jonathan, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, this is really important for our democracy, and obviously this is a special election under special circumstances, and uh, I appreciate the great turnout tonight. Uh, my name is Caleb Frostman. I grew up here in Green Bay, uh, and I uh, have worked the last couple of years I'm in the private sector the last 11 years, uh, both in commercial real estate finance and in economic development. I live in Sturgeon Bay now, and I, between my private sector experience and my engagement in my community, those perspectives and those um, activities and endeavors have led me to believe and know that middle class folks have been asked to do too much with too little for too long. And I'm running because I don't think that shared sacrifice is a term that should just apply to the bottom 99% of income earners. And I'm running because as a hunter, I care more about the health of the landscape and access to quality public hunting lands. And at the same time, I know that we can enact common sense gun legislation that won't infringe upon our hunting heritage, will save lives, and won't prevent responsible gun owners from owning firearms. And I'm running because I care more about, or excuse me, I care less about who uses which bathroom and more about whether that human waste or animal waste ends up in our drinking water. And I'm running because I believe and I'm excited at the opportunity to legislate as if healthcare were a human right and not something to be profited off of. And I'm running because I believe that if you're willing to put in 40 hours a week that you are entitled to a dignified life. And that means a roof over your head, food on your table, and access to affordable health care. So I'm running for the first Senate district seat uh, to be a re uh, responsive, a collaborative, and a cooperative senator uh, for the first Senate district. And I hope to earn your opportunity uh, to vote for me tonight. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Caleb. Andre, three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you to the Green Bay Press Gazette for offering us this venue, as well as having a rather sizable crowd for a debate for the past ones that I've participated in, so it's great to see that level of engagement and involvement here tonight. I'm Andre Jacques, I represent currently the 2nd Assembly District 
which is the southern part of Brown County, northern Mantua County, and the central part of the district, and uh, was first elected in 2010, been in office since January 2011, and I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve together. And I say that because my successes have been the district successes. My ideas come from the people that I serve. And what I want to do is make the state of Wisconsin better than where it was when I took office. I have five children and my wife and I live in the, the pier right across from St. Norbert Football Stadium. And uh, been able to make some real concrete gains in terms of public safety, in terms of economic development and getting government out of the way of job creation, making uh, really some major achievements in terms of worker training. Uh, of course, public safety when it comes to the hit and run loophole closed, the child enticement loophole closed, uh, drunk driving, domestic violence, human trafficking. Uh, very proud of my community involvement. That was how I was really raised by my parents, was to be deeply embedded in the community, to give back. And uh, politics is really something that took me out of my comfort zone. It's really something where I uh, never thought that I would be on this side of the microphone. Maybe, maybe help write a few speeches, maybe knock some doors for other people, but uh, as with something else, uh, I used to be afraid of needles. Now I'm a 13-gallon blood and platelet donor through the Red Cross. So. Uh, this is something where I really enjoy the conversations that I get to have with people, whether it's at events or at their doors, and then be able to carry them through into successful law. And, uh, you know, being involved with Green Bay Area Crime Stoppers, uh, the Golden House Domestic Violence Shelter, on the board of Family and Child Care Resources in Northeast Wisconsin, the Paul Van Handel Memorial Foundation for Families of Children with Disabilities. And, uh, you know, it, it really is something where uh, I've been given a lot of opportunities in this job to be able to help people with really sometimes very tragic situations where nothing might bring their son or daughter back or there might be opportunities that have been missed already in terms of economic development or uh, really what I get to do is to hopefully get government to meet the common sense test and I'm proud that we've been able to do that in terms of environmental protection in terms of common sense changes within our health care laws and uh, I see that my time's running out so I'll just end there but I want to thank you all for coming here today. All right, thanks, Andre. Um, we're going to pose the first question to you, uh, and that is, uh, what do you see as the single most important problem or challenge facing residents of the First Senate District, uh, and what can be done about it? Well, it, you know, you hear so many different ideas from people when you go across the district. You don't want to boil it down to just one issue, although certainly I think when we're in a position where we do have low unemployment here in Wisconsin, which is a great thing, we actually have the lowest veterans unemployment in the entire country, which is fantastic. And I think we've been doing a number of things in terms of dealing with uh, opportunities for individuals with disabilities or uh, really across the board, uh, child care opportunities. Um, but worker training is something that I have worked very much with uh, apprenticeship programs and tools of the trade, uh, which almost made it through the legislature this session in the past. Uh, working with apprenticeship programs as well in terms of tuition reimbursement, but really uh, the fast forward grant program and a lot of the things that we've been able to do through the technical college system, I think are, are real positives. I think we've focused on how we can hopefully make investments that are going to have young people want to be able to return to our communities, and that's really key, especially with having, again, five kids of my own that I want to have stay here in state. So we've been able to do some things with broadband, that's certainly very important as well. Uh, one of the things that I was pleased to really take the lead on within the last budget process was dealing with reciprocity within some of our skilled trades programs, something that we really haven't otherwise talked about, but something that's certainly critical when you look at you know, the demographic challenge that Wisconsin faces like most of the country, which is dealing with a situation where, you know, unfortunately, we have fewer people entering the workforce than are retiring every day. So. Uh, it's something where we have a lot of opportunities to make those strategic investments. I mean, it depends a little bit on where you are in the district. Uh, you know, the Southern Bridge is obviously very important to residents of the pier in that area in terms of the economic development opportunities that have been bypassed. It's important that I think for a lot of things we have a strong independent voice, and that's what I hear from people, is they want somebody who's going to be a strong independent voice for the area, and that's what I think I'll be. Thanks, Andre. Caleb, what is the most uh, pressing issue or problem facing the district, and how would you solve it? Yeah, I think we're knocking the same doors, because uh, what I've been hearing about the district is similar 
in that we need to focus on quantity of jobs, and we have with the unemployment rate, uh, but need to make sure those jobs are quality jobs, that they can provide a dignified life for folks, and whether that's through additional training. Um, in my time as executive director of the Door County Economic Development Corporation, youth workforce development was our, our top priority, and we did focus on youth apprenticeships. We focused on making those connections between students and the employers early and often, and trying to deepen those connections. Uh, for retention purposes and also for uh, both the students' career prospects as well as uh, the employer's ability to recruit and retain talent throughout the district. And so as I look at, again, yeah, the unemployment rate being where it's at, I believe strongly that we need to look at where wages have gone over the last seven or eight years and adjusted for inflation, wages have stagnated uh, since 2010, 2011. So making sure that folks that are working two and three jobs uh, and working more than 40 hours a week have the opportunity to make it and make sure that we give them the capacity either to return to the workforce after a time off, to advance within the workforce, or enter it for the first time. And so I think folks um, looking at economic development, workforce development, uh, that's what people at Doors are telling me, and that's what I feel uh, throughout uh, the First Senate District having knocked doors for the last 61 days. All right, thank you. This is just a plug again. If you're watching on Facebook, you can post a question in the comment section, and we will attempt to relay your question to the candidates here. And if you're joining us uh, in the audience, um, you can fill out a form uh, that has uh, where you can write down your question and bring that to Carl Ebert down here. Uh, we'll go to the next question, uh, which involves Kiwani County. Uh, and um, Caleb, well, this one will start with you. Uh, Kiwani County is grappling with unprecedented groundwater contamination. Some residents must rely on bottled water because their wells have excessive nitrates. Uh, a study last year found that 60% of sampled wells in the county contained fecal microbes, both um, from cattle and humans. Uh, and the question is, what role should the state play in addressing these problems? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's probably number two on the list when I knock on doors throughout SD1, uh, is the groundwater head, uh, contamination issues throughout the Karst Geo region. And I'm really encouraged uh, by the progress that's been made on the compromises with NR151. I think that's a giant step in the right direction, which is legislation that dictates when you can spread manure, where you can spread it in terms of soil depth, uh, and also in proximity to residential wells. So I think that compromise between farmers, between environmentalists and legislators is a very, very strong indicator that there is consensus that this is a serious issue, that yes, 60% of Kiwani County wells are contaminated and between a quarter and a third are unsafe to drink. So obviously Kiwani County is very strong agriculturally, but we wanna make sure that those regulations, we monitor them very closely going forward and that the DNR is fully funded and fully staffed to enforce those rules that if those rules are on the books, we need to make sure that they're being followed and that there are adequate staff to monitor these nutrient management plans and that there are teeth in the enforcements to make sure uh, that they are followed going forward. So it's a huge issue. Folks all over the district know about it. Uh, they're really concerned with it. And like I said, I'm very uh, encouraged by the compromise. We need to monitor that going forward, refine it as necessary, and make sure that the DNR is adequately staffed and funded to make sure that those rules are followed. Thanks, Andre. Uh, uh, what role should the state play, uh, if any, in the groundwater problems in Kiwani County? Sure. Well, you know, I would agree that I, I think we've made some steps forward in terms of the NR 151 rules that have come forward. Um, you know, during my time in the legislature, that area has been represented by former Representative Gary Byes as well as current Representative Joel Kitchens. I know they put forward a number of ideas to deal with the situation, which I've largely supported. Uh, in fact, I think universally supported, sometimes co-authored, uh, sometimes separate from that. I've actually authored an extension of the Clean Drinking Water Program back in 2013, which I uh, was praised by the League of Conservation Voters. I understand they've got some negative ads against me right now, but uh, you know, I, I, We've made Niagara escarpment purchases through the stewardship program a priority. We've made a number of changes to make sure that we're able to continue to receive federal funding for clean water. Uh, I actually serve on the DNR Small Business Environmental Council. I'm also on the, the Great Lakes Caucus. And uh, there are things that we can do in terms of, well, in the assembly, we passed legislation to allow for remediation of contaminated wells, of course, with dealing with lead pipes, uh, standards for state watershed protection grants, uh, our state funds for watershed protection grants, but uh, you know tomorrow there's actually a tour that I've participated in for the last several years uh, by the Clean Bay Backers or Save the Bay, where we take a look firsthand at 
rotational grazing, cover crops, some of the things that can be proposed to be able to help deal with excessive manure spreading. Certainly digesters, anaerobic digesters have been put forward as an idea as well, but uh, as somebody who's always been, I think, very involved in environmental protection going back to my time in high school when I was uh, an officer in our environmental club all four years, I, I think, you know, nobody wants unsafe drinking water, nobody wants to have lessened environmental standards, and I think we've been able to uphold those uh, but as far as Kiwani, you know, the major thing was within the budget, something that I very strongly supported was the TMDL, Total Maximum Daily Load, uh, funding for the Eastern Wisconsin watersheds, and I'm hopeful that we'll find some things there in terms of the non-point source pollution. Thank you. All right. Thanks to you both for answering that question. Uh, we'll take one more prepared question, and then we'll see if there are any questions from uh, the audience or from Facebook. Uh, next question, we'll start with Andre. Uh, here's the question. The current state budget expanded Wisconsin's school voucher program. How do you see the future of vouchers in Wisconsin? Well, I mean, I think if you look at school funding in general, and certainly we've been on a trajectory now for the past several budgets where we have increased per pupil spending, we have uh, increased sparsity aids, we've increased, uh, really, I think, in a lot of ways, the inputs in the system. We also have to look at how that money is spent because above an adequacy level, which we've been well above here in Wisconsin for some time, it's how you spend that money, not just how much you have. And certainly we've seen districts that sometimes outperform others with similar demographics. Um, when you're talking about the voucher program, uh, I think of school choice broadly in terms of somebody that has, you know, I actually was a co-author of the uh, public school choice uh, or the open enrollment expansion uh, that took place back in 2011 uh, session, it might have been 2012 when it was enacted. Um, but I think broadly when you look at whether it's public schools, charter, choice, uh, I think when you have more options, you know, one size doesn't fit all when it comes to students. And I think that's important that we, you know, provide as many options for students and for parents to make sure that, uh, you know, we really have the best educational outcomes. I actually, at UW-Madison, kids and I both went to UW-Madison, but uh, one of my professors for a few of my classes was the evaluator for the, the, the voucher program and found that it worked very well in, in Milwaukee and he was by no means right of center. Uh, he looked at the apples to apples comparison and found that it did boost student achievement. And I think to take that statewide is you know, something that has accrued to the benefit of parents and students. And uh, so I, I've been pleased to support the program. Thanks, Andre. Caleb, how do you see the future of school vouchers in Wisconsin? Sure. I, as a senator, would make sure that our, our public schools are adequately funded. I'm concerned uh, at the higher per pupil reimbursement to voucher schools at our public schools. Uh, as a pow proud public school graduate from here in Green Bay at East High School, uh, I know that a school is more than just an education. It's a piece of the community's fabric. And I want to make sure that we strengthen those schools that may be struggling in Green Bay or elsewhere. Uh, and as our rural schools face funding challenges and uh, teacher recruitment and retention challenges, I think it's incumbent upon us, especially in SD1, uh, to make sure that those public schools, those rural public schools, are adequately funded and not at the cost of, of voucher schools. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to an audience question now. Uh, Carl, uh, what question uh, have uh, people asked? Well, based on what we've gotten so far, there's a lot of interest in the water issue. Not on. Not on. Your mic is not on. Your mic? Okay. There's been a several questions about the Kiwani groundwater issue, and so we'll continue with that, um, especially since both of you had referenced NR-151. This question is, an administrative law judge has characterized the groundwater problem in karstic regions as a massive regulatory failure. What immediate steps would you take or should be taken to bring large farms under the revised NR-151 rules? We'll start with that, Caleb. Uh, I think, uh, as far as I understand, talking to folks within SD1 and our legislators in that area, I believe NR151 is scheduled to be uh, signed into law, I believe, in July of this year. So that first step is important, and uh, I want to make sure, again, like I said, that the DNR uh, is adequately funded and staffed, but making sure NR151 is signed into law as that represents a significant compromise uh, from all sides and I think is, uh, has the potential to make a pretty serious difference pretty quickly. Thank you, Andre. Sure, well, um, one of the things that uh, Kiwani County has expressed to me sitting down with their board chairman as well as their county administrator 
is the importance of having staffing for, uh, I mean, there, there is currently staffing that is allocated in the budget, but in terms of being able to get that position filled. And I think one of the concerns that was expressed is that that warden feels that sometimes they're kind of put in the middle of things in terms of enforcing the law. So that's, that's going to be a question. Um, but I mean, I think you look at the different karst topography of our region, and that's certainly something that impacts things like wind sighting or other issues as well, where you know it, it is just a, a something that we have to take special care of because it is a geographically distinct feature from what a lot of the rest of the state deals with. So, um, you know, a, as far as how do we make sure that um, that there's uniform enforcement? I mean, I think. We want to look at uniform enforcement across the board in, in all areas of our laws because that's how we're going to ultimately get to better, you know, I, I would say, better adherence in a lot of different ways and be able to make the right decisions as policymakers rather than looking the other way on, on certain things. So, uh, you know, I guess what I would say is make sure that uh, that we have a level playing field for everybody. Okay, thanks, Andre. Uh, we'll take another audience question here. Okay, this one is uh, more of a get, getting to know you kind of question. Uh, you both have different opinions and views on important issues. Can you explain how you arrived at those positions, your viewpoints, or the philosophies that drive where you're at? And we'll start with Andre. Sure. Well, um, boy, I mean, the, because there's so many different issues, it's, it's tough to really boil it down to something other than, um, you know, my parents always instilled in me a belief in civic involvement and also, uh, you know, honesty, integrity, doing the right thing. And that means that you're not saying something different in, in one room and something else in the next. And uh, I think that certainly served me well in my time in the legislature. That's why I sought out opportunities, even when there have been debates or, or other opportunities to talk to groups that you know, maybe wouldn't be perceived as ideologically to my advantage. Um, I want, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with defending my record and talking about what I believe and, and really a lot of it just boils down to, you know, helping the little guy or finding where government doesn't pass the common sense test or is getting in the way of doing the right thing, uh, looking at how am I going to make, it, you know, a better community for my kids to grow up in. Um, as far as my larger, you know, ideology, I mean, I, I certainly, I'm a social and fiscal conservative and I'm proud of that. Um, but I think I also, you know, have bucked my party on any number of things where I believe that it's in the best interest of my district and my underlying principles. And you know, the, certainly that's put me on the wrong side of a few special interests. That's put me on the wrong side of some legislative leaders. But uh, you know, again, I, I guess I look at it as you know, I vote whether it's on the floor or in the voting booth as if the only thing that depends uh, is dependent on is my conscience and being able to sleep soundly at night, look myself in the mirror, and uh, that's what I'm proud to do. Thanks, Andre. Caleb. Absolutely. So, in my household, uh, yeah, community service was never-ending and non-negotiable. My mother um, instilled that in me very early. And my perspective uh, really changed uh, in college. I had a really close friend that um, came out of the closet at the exact same time that the Constitutional Amendment in Wisconsin was moving forward to make the definition of marriage between a man and a woman, and I saw how that legislation affected him and how the stories he'd been told in his life had affected his thoughts about himself. And then when I worked in the private sector uh, in commercial real estate finance, um, you know, being in you know, really, really large uh, transactions and working with um, you know, high-level professionals at Monday through Friday, and then I'd spend the weekends as a mentor to a young man uh, in the inner city, and I marveled at his mother's work ethic. She, worked 40 hours a week as a healthcare professional, answered phones 20 hours a week at Wells Fargo, and went to school part-time on the weekends uh, to get a further accreditation for her healthcare field. And I noticed very distinctly that she was not getting the same return on her investment uh, that the folks were Monday through Friday uh, in the towers of high finance. And so I started thinking, you know, what, what are the reasons for that outcome? You know, perhaps she's not getting the same return on the investment. I look back at, at my family social safety net and where those gains had come from and I paid very close attention over the years to how policy and how legislation affects people and that is what has made me the proud progressive that I am today uh, looking at policy and how it affects people and how we can improve the quality of life of the people around us who are working hard and deserve the same return on investment 
uh, that folks in the top 1% uh, do as well. All right, thanks guys. I understand we have a, a Facebook question, Pete? Yes, we do. The question is, considering that the state is at full employment, how do you attribute poverty in the cities and in some rural areas, and what would you do to address it? We'll start with Caleb. Sure. Great question. So poverty in uh, urban and rural areas. So this is kind of going back to those comments made earlier about making sure that we are focusing both on the quantity of jobs and the quality of those jobs. If we look at employment statistics, there's never been a time in Wisconsin when more Wisconsinites have been in the workforce, nor has there been a time when there's been a higher percentage of able-bodied workers working or looking for work. So people are working hard. And as I mentioned earlier, wages have stagnated uh, since 2010, 2011, when adjusted for inflation. So the things that I would look at doing uh, would be making smarter investments. As we look at, you know, I think it's consensus that the, the flow of currency into the economy is what drives economic growth. And I think that middle class consumers are a better investment of those tax dollars, whether it's through uh, increased funding to education, to health care, or to job training, uh, than things like the Manufacturing Act tax credit that 70% of that uh, has gone to folks making more than a million dollars a year. Uh, I want to make sure that those taxpayer funded investments uh, go to folks that need to buy necessities that have been holding off on fixing their car, holding off on fixing their roof, uh, holding off on health care uh, purchases. And so I think that those type of investments are what I look at as the highest return that allow folks to lead that dignified life but buy things that they need, not hoping that luxury purchases, the proceeds from that will somehow trickle down to the rest of us. Thanks. Andre? Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, a great question. You know, some of the things that I've focused on legislatively deal with eliminating unfunded mandates on local government, trying to find ways that we can keep property taxes affordable for those on fixed incomes. But certainly a key portion of it is dealing with workers training, the skills gap. The fact that we have a lot of employers that are capable of expanding hiring and taking on additional or, or additional projects for existing clients. Uh, and unfortunately we don't have the skill set or uh, one of the big obstacles that we have is, is drug testing. Uh, we have individuals who can't pass a drug test and ensure the safety of themselves and others while they're on the job. So I've been pleased to support those opportunities as well as within our public benefit programs, make sure that that safety net is still going to be available. Make sure that it is going to be a hand up and it's going to be something that is going to offer those opportunities. You know, there is positive wage pressure that's coming just from, from demographics, but ultimately the issue is we have a lot of jobs to be filled that we need to make sure that we have the appropriate training. So that's why we keep talking about worker training and apprenticeship and youth apprenticeship, which is something that I've been involved in. I used to be a, a board member for Brown County Team Leadership, but also within the Green Bay Chamber and the youth apprenticeship programs and some of the additional funding we were able to get the state for that. I mean, when you give employers a chance to test drive employees, when you get the chance for potential new employees to get a, a sense of the culture of the workforce, um, you know, it is something where we're, we're going to continue to give people opportunities for good paying jobs here in Wisconsin and uh, you know I, we certainly have those opportunities available just in terms of what's posted really it comes down to enabling people to take advantages uh, take advantage of those opportunities for training and retraining and that's something that you know as a former student member of the higher education aids board uh, you know yeah when you have economic issues people laid off you know they're going to turn to the tech college system for retraining but we have a lot of great job opportunities available right now thank you all right, thanks guys. Uh, are there any other Facebook questions right now, Pete? Yes, I have. All right, in April, over 70% of Outagamie County residents voted for a referendum in favor of fair nonpartisan redistricting. Would you support fair maps legislation for Wisconsin that would establish a process similar to Iowa? If you don't support that, what benefit to citizens do you see in gerrymandering? Thank you, and we'll start with uh, Andre, and then go to Caleb. Well, that's a it's a little bit of a loaded question, yes. but I can tell you, you know, in the last round of redistricting, I was actually one of the very few representatives who actually was drawn out of his district, and uh, the majority of my district was put in a different area. I had to move at the considerable expense to my family and I, um, and yet you look at the court criteria for those maps, and historically, what it always has been is 
compactness, contiguity, and equality of, popula uh, equality of population. Those have always been the court test for redistricting. And on all three of those measures, the Wisconsin map significantly improved on really past redistricting in the state of Wisconsin, but certainly over the, the other maps that were put forward. It, it's something where it's very difficult to, I mean, I think if you say something is going to be fair or if you say something is going to be nonpartisan, that's fantastic. But really the, the nonpartisan nature of the people that are making those decisions is something that's very easy to call into question. And certainly the state of Wisconsin is different from other states that have tried some of those experiments, but you look at some of the past court drawn maps and you had somebody who, again, is supposed to be nonpartisan, even though very strong former Democrat legislative ties, uh, Barbara Crabb, uh, her top priority was making sure that nobody was drawn together in the same district the redistricting. Well, that, that would have worked out well for me, but it wouldn't necessarily have made the maps any fairer than what we came up with 10 years ago. So. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, what I would say with, with redistricting, very frequently it is a, a, a court-drawn process, um, but ultimately if you're looking at equality of population, and uh, I mean really what you've seen is, uh, you know, I think superior candidates, or, or it, you look at the, the, the shifts that can occur just with a, a slight partisan win, um, you know, I'm still in a district that's just as competitive as, uh, in, the, in terms of the assembly, as, as what I started with, I haven't had a Democratic opponent the last two cycles, and I have defeated a Democratic incumbent when I, when I won. All so. right. Thank you. Kelly? Yeah, I would absolutely support uh, a system similar to Iowa's where a nonpartisan board draws uh, and does the redistricting. Um, I firmly believe that voters should choose their legislator and not the other way around. So I would absolutely be in favor. I think I can't remember if it was 2014 or 2016, uh, but here in Wisconsin, um, 52% of the popular vote for, I guess it's like 50% of the vote for assembly persons uh, went to Republicans, but they won 63 of 99 seats. So that, you know, not just because I'm on the wrong side of it, but that there's something uh, troubling with that numerical figure. So I would absolutely be in char or in favor of a system similar to Iowa's where uh, a nonpartisan board draws those districts. All right, thank you. Uh, Carl, do we have another question from the audience? Sure. Um, we talked about jobs and economic development a little bit, and there were several questions about the uh, Foxconn deal. And so I'd like to hear from each of you um, your analysis of it. Um, there's a significant public investment. Is that the best bang for the buck, or were there smaller projects that should be pursued instead? And we'll start with Caleb and then go to Andre. Sure. Can I have 10 minutes? <laughs> um, just kidding. Um, so yes, as a former banker and an economic developer, the Foxconn deal is troubling to me. I would have voted against it for five main reasons, uh, one of which is the size of incentive on a per job basis. It's more than 10 times the previous record, which is Mercury Marine, at $220,000 per job. Uh, the Wisconsin taxpayers on the hook for approximately four years of Foxconn payroll. Uh, similarly, the second piece for me is the average wage of the Foxconn worker for a $3 billion investment from the state. Uh, $53,000 a year um, is, is troublesome for me that we bet that large on this investment and that the average wage is $53,000 a year. Uh, the other piece for me is the, the expected repayment term. So a 25-year term is extremely risky in any industry. When I was in commercial real estate, we never would have touched a 25-year deal, especially when the repayment is based on something as risky and as fickle as technology. Uh, if Wisconsin had invested $3 billion of today's dollars in 1993 in CD players, we'd be in big trouble. And so uh, that's problematic to me. And then uh, the fourth is the environmental uh, relaxations. Uh, similar in my banking history, if things are outside the box in terms of size and term, you tighten covenants, you don't uh, loosen them. And so I would have tightened uh, wetland regulations. And I know the Republicans like to talk about a two to one wetland mitigation ratio. However, a newly created wetland is not nearly as effective at water filtration and, and fostering aquatic life and bird life and insect life as an existing wetlands. That's problematic for me. And then the biggest piece, number five, is the opportunity cost of that $3 billion to the rest of the state. Dividing that $3 billion by 33 Senate districts is $86 million, which for SD1 could have paid for a lot of new roads, could have paid for school investments, could have paid for opioid treat, uh, treatment, it could have paid for entrepreneurial support. Uh, we will see very little uh, benefit from that $3 billion invested in the southeast corner of the state. Thanks, Andre. Thank you, Jonathan. You know, 
the old Mark Twain quote of theirs, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You know, I, I, you can cherry pick certain things, but you know, anytime you're talking about $54,000 in terms of an average job created as being too small, you know, I mean, I thought we were trying to create good paying middle class jobs. I, I mean, you look at the perception, and if this was a Democratic administration that let this opportunity go by, look at how they would have been howling. Oh, see, the Wisconsin turnaround isn't real. Look at all the things. I mean, really, there were a lot of things that we had to do in Wisconsin just to get to the point that Foxconn would consider Wisconsin for investment. And that's really what we do, is get government out of the way for job creation. Get Look at the, whether it's tort reform or regulatory reform, look at the things that keep people from making investments, from expanding their businesses. And this is something where the supply chain is certainly going to just reach up into the lakeshore, into the Fox Valley. I think Caleb in previous interviews has referenced the fact that it's going to benefit some businesses in Door County. I know it certainly is going to benefit businesses in my assembly district because I toured them. But I can tell you, I mean, we have made other sizable investments. You look at the size of the investment, it's not out of line with what we made elsewhere. It's really the size of Foxconn's investment that is so much bigger than anything else that we've seen. And you look at what that's going to do in terms of the supply chain and the other uh, businesses that have announced their own expansions or moving into the state of Wisconsin. This is a pay as you grow. This is something where there are clawbacks. There is no money paid out unless Foxconn delivers every step of the way. So if, if Foxconn doesn't meet what it says it's going to do, then those costs aren't going to be borne by taxpayers, but ultimately it's going to be a benefit to the state of Wisconsin. We're already seeing that. We're already seeing that in terms of people that want to come to Wisconsin. We're talking about careers in information technology and others where, uh, you know, the, the ripple effect I think is substantial. So, you know, it was something that I looked at very skeptically but uh, at first, but I think ultimately passed the test. All right, thanks guys. Another plug uh, for questions. If you're in the audience, uh, you can bring them to Carl Ebert here. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, you can uh, type them in the comment section uh, and we will uh, review them. Uh, I'll pose a question uh, that we had, um, and that is, did you support Governor Walker's initial decision not to hold a special election uh, for this district, and why or why not? Uh, we'll start with Andre and then go to Caleb. Well, I, I mean, I think I've said kind of consistently, you know, from the beginning I have no control over whether the governor chooses to hold a special election or not. I certainly would have been fine with him calling a special election that would have coincided with the spring. Um, honestly, with the, the timing of when Senator Lassay vacated his position, this very well could have, we could have had a special election spring of 2017 and I would have been happy to run then as well because that was a conversation that I had with my wife. But I can tell you that, uh, you know, at the point at which the election was called, and obviously for partisan purposes, I mean, you look at the size of the investment from the outside group that's now supporting my opponent, uh, you know, they're looking at talking points and not really looking at the residents of the first Senate district because ultimately, you know, at the point that there is a vacancy, and I can tell you for most of this past legislative session, I've been getting a lot of calls from people outside of my assembly district that are in the first Senate district for assistance. I've always worked to help my colleagues or people from throughout northeastern Wisconsin when they have those ideas. And yeah, I've filled in at Eagle Scout Courts of Honor, things of that nature. But it is something where, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of purpose that is served now in the fact that we already have to have our nomination signatures in for the fall before we even have the results of <laughs> the special election. So you're going to be seeing Caleb and I maybe back here in the same room for another debate for, for the fall. And I look forward to that if, that if that's the case. But, um, it, you know, obviously we're both running in both the special election and for the fall, and there isn't necessarily a lot that's going to happen in the last six months of the year, but I'm certainly going to be there to serve my constituents regardless. And I think it's the sort of thing where, um, yeah, I. I guess I, I appreciate the opportunity that I have to, to serve the district. I'd love to be able to serve uh, the rest of the district as senator for the, the last month of the year, but we're going to be running again. So. All right, Kelly? Yeah, so it's interesting. I was surprised by the hesitancy to hold the special election. I recall a small disagreement on uh, taxation with no representation a few years ago in this country. And, um, so I, I actually agree with Andre. I would have you know, been encouraged had it happened in the spring. Uh, it would have been more cost-effective for the taxpayers, but I'm grateful it's happening now. 
Uh, so I did not agree with his decision or his perspective on not holding it. I'm glad it's happening. Uh, I wish it would have happened in the spring just for the taxpayers, but uh, but it's happening on June 12th. All right, thanks. Carl, uh, are there any questions from the audience? You bet there are. All right. Um, this question is, what is your position on repealing or changing Act 10? What, if any, change would you make specifically, and can you evaluate the effectiveness of the legislation? I'm sorry, can you read the last part of that? The, the last part is, a, is an evaluation of Act 10 as, as legislation. Is it played out as, as expected, or does it need to be adjusted? This was the controversial legislation that removed uh, collective bargaining rights for nearly all uh, public employees in the state. So we'll start out uh, with uh, Caleb and then go to Andre. Sure. Uh, the, the effect of, of Act 10, the effects, plural, of Act 10 have been uh, really troubling uh, to watch. I've seen uh, long, long, uh, very close friendships and family relationships be broken over this act and, and what, it, what it tried to do, um, or what it did, I should say, it was successful moving forward. Uh, but removing teachers' abilities to collectively bargain in other uh, public unions has been detrimental uh, to our ability to recruit and retain our best and brightest public servants in uh, the teaching profession otherwise. It has uh, vilified a profession that used to be honored, and it becomes more and more difficult for us. If we want to have our students have the best chance at a good life, uh, we need to attract and retain the best teachers, and that starts with treating them with respect and allowing them to uh, collective, uh, actually bargain collectively. Uh, it's difficult for uh, one person to make a difference, but collectively they can they can do that. And so I'm really troubled and I am frustrated. Um, you know, with the, this idea that I mentioned earlier in the opening statements about shared sacrifice. Um, you know, making sure that that uh, you know teachers pay in more of their health insurance when you know we should maybe try to find ways to make sure that other folks have just as as, as great a uh, health care package as teachers do. And so it's been troubling to me. I think the effects have been very detrimental to uh, our teaching population as well as our ability to attract and retain new teachers to Wisconsin uh, since 2011. Thank you. Andre? Well, you know, as somebody who actually was in the legislature, it was my first term back in 2011 when Act 10 was passed, and I can tell you it was a, a crazy situation. I was calling back people from my office as they were trying to break into my office on one of the nights before one of the pivotal votes. But, uh, back home, I was able to have respectful discussions with people on both sides of the issue. And I feel a little bit bad for every Act 10, because every session there's a 10th Act that's signed. So I can remember one that dealt with domestic violence restraining orders that I was part of. Obviously, that's not an Act 10 that we refer to as Act 10. But um, I can tell you that when I took that vote, I was very insistent that there were no carve-outs for legislators. I mean, everything that affected any other public uh, employee, I mean, that was something where my own health care and pension costs increased as well. It was something where, you know, I look at people that felt like they didn't necessarily have a say in some of the uh, the contracts at the, at the local level, but I can tell you that we gave tools to local government, and that was something that didn't happen when the previous Democratic administration made cuts to education, made cuts in a lot of different areas without giving the, the tools on the cost side of the equation. We can't just look at inputs. We have to look at process improvement. And that's what Act 10 did. It reset the stage, and we've been able to, since then, give, uh, give actual pay increases. So I can just say, you know, both of my parents are former public employees, retired public employees. I myself was a former public employee before I took this job. It wasn't a pay increase for me when I, uh, when I went over to the State Assembly. But I think there is something uh, very valuable in terms of public service just as I've worked in the private sector as well. But I will say that it's something where when you look at what we did in terms of giving the tools for local governments to manage their own budgets, I think it's uh, ultimately uh, a very positive thing that we did for the state of Wisconsin and it's resulted in uh, property taxes that are in check. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience? Sure. This discrimination on the basis of gender expression is currently currently per permitted under Wisconsin law, which has prompted some communities in the district to consider ordinances uh, on the local level. What would you do, if anything, to protect transgender people at work and at school? Thank you. We'll start with Andre and then go to Caleb. 
So, talking about gender identity, which largely has been something where it's based on a, a self-proclamation, it's not based on uh, a biological indicator or anything other than essentially, I mean, we've heard about how gender expression can switch among many, many multiple types of genders. Uh, it's the sort of thing where there have been concerns about uh, you know, the imposition on private businesses, on individuals who want safety when in a, a public place. Um, you know, it's something where, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, what was the, the, the question was more specific to? What, what would you have to do, if anything, on the state level to uh, protect transgender people from discrimination? Okay, uh, sure. I mean, I think that any time that you are engaging in conduct that is, you know, bullying or, I mean, something that, that crosses any sort of a, a legal line, certainly we need to have strong standards across the board. We need to go after perpetrators of abuse or uh, threats or violence. Um, but I also think that, you know, when you're talking about making sure that there is respect for religious expression as well, um, I mean, I, I think what we have to do is, um, you know, have a, a, a standard where uh, we respect the rights of private businesses and, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I guess the, the, the challenge with talking about transgender or gender identity is the extent to which it's based on, you know, something that is self-stated as opposed to based on science. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Caleb. Sure, um, I would absolutely uh, put forth legislation to close that loophole. Um, again, as I mentioned, one of the reasons that I got involved in politics in the first place was um, having close friends in the LGBT community, and our LGBT youth attempt suicide at a rate four times higher than their straight peers, and 70% of them report hearing negative messages about their gender identity and their orientation from their elected officials. So those kind of loopholes and refusal to close them and co-sponsoring legislation to allow for businesses to discriminate against folks due to gender identity is extremely problematic for me and it's one of the reasons I got involved in politics in the first place and I'll be a strong LGBT champion uh, until the day I die and hopefully uh, a strong ally uh, in the state senate of Wisconsin. Please hold your applause until the end. Thank you. Uh, the next question will touch on infrastructure, uh, and we'll start with Caleb and then go to Andre. Uh, the question is, is, Wisconsin has some of the worst roads in the nation. The state's highway system is deteriorating, excuse me, deteriorating, while some municipalities are imposing or considering wheel taxes, or in the case of Sturgeon Bay, a premier resort area tax to help fund local road repairs. Uh, what can be done to address crumbling infrastructure in the state, and how would you pay for it? Sure. Great question, and it's probably the second uh, most common question I get been asked since I've been on the campaign trail. But uh, my answer has been it needs to be a holistic solution. It needs to be a comprehensive look at all of the things that people talk about, whether that's uh, indexing the gas tax, increasing the gas tax, uh, looking at an increased vehicle registration fee, uh, and or tolling. And I've been, uh, I was encouraged, I got to watch in Sturgeon Bay as you know, the local folks got together as part of a, a task force to look at what makes sense for road improvements. They chose the Premier Resort Area Tax. Uh, they passed it unanimously at the City Council level. They passed it by a referendum 70-30. Uh, but at the statewide level, uh, it needs to be comprehensive, and we cannot allow ideologues in Madison who do not want to raise fees or taxes uh, for any reason whatsoever uh, while we're driving on gravel roads in 2018. And so I talked to businesses in Sturgeon Bay and throughout Door County, throughout the district, and they have told me their first opportunity to make an effective product is when it leaves the factory and it bounces around the back of their truck and their thousand dollar component comes back because it has a 100 inch of a dent in the product. And so I've seen firsthand the impact of a four lane highway into Door County, what that's done for our industry, for our agriculture, and for our tourism. And so these investments pay dividends not only while they're being built, but after they've been built for our businesses, for our residents. And so this is something we have to come to a conclusion that we can't uh, look at our next job and, and say, you know, I, I didn't raise fees or taxes. Well, I'd rather look at a record of compromise and a record of collaboration and new roads that work really well for our residents, for our businesses, uh, and for our tourists. So 
It's a comprehensive solution. All options need to be on the table, um, and that's what I'll look at as Senator in SD1. Thanks, Andre. Sure. So, I guess what I would say is uh, I have been a strong supporter of infrastructure for Northeast Wisconsin. Certainly, want to see the Southern Bridge and De Pere get built. But on top of that, if you look at what we've done in terms of transportation funding in the state, which has increased over time, but local road funding has not increased. We have seen mega projects, we've seen southeastern Wisconsin get more than its fair share, and it is something where you take one of those large projects that get enumerated and spread their impact statewide and be fairly substantial for northeastern Wisconsin for things like 441 or talking about Southern Bridge or other opportunities that, I mean, certainly we've seen 41 and 43 recently get some attention, but, um, you know, and when you look at the actual road condition, you do have to uh, sometimes look at who's doing the study. I mean, it is kind of interesting when you have the Road Builders Union talking about how bad our roads are, but it, it is something where, you know, I'm very pleased to have the support of I over 100, well, probably 120 current and former local elected officials. Actually, I'm sure it's much higher than that. I haven't added to the website, but um, because I've looked at how can we reform the process, and certainly that's something at the state level we try to get things under budget, and what I've done with prevailing wage at the local level means that your road dollar builds more roads at the local level than what it does for a state or federal highway project. So I want to make sure that we do get our fair share for local roads, but I would also say because we reversed what had been done by Governor Doyle in terms of rating the transportation fund, we can now put money into the, the general fund and it'll stay there on an ongoing basis. It gets built into the base. We can also uh, eliminate things like electric utility taxes for the other half of the year or eliminate the phony phone tax that was a revenue generator created by Governor Doyle even against some of his Democratic legislators. And, uh, and in place of doing that, we can then look at registration or uh, gas tax increases and uh, something that is going to hopefully lead to a sustainable solution. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, and this uh, may be the last question. We'll see how, how time prevails. Uh, the question is, the Blue Ribbon Commission on School Funding is about to start drafting a possible new public school funding formula. Uh, the current formula leans heavily on a district's student count and uh, land values, and this puts many small and rural schools at a disadvantage. Uh, what are your thoughts on the current school funding formula, and uh, should it be made more equitable for smaller and rural districts? Uh, we'll start with Andre and then go to Caleb. Sure. So I guess what I would say is we're always striving to increase equity within our state formulas. That's one of the big problems that when government tries to impose a one-size-fits-all solution, and we've seen it within the shared revenue formula, we've seen, seen it in, in other areas as well where it, you have parochial interests in parts of the state that are able to shield areas from cuts, or you have really uh, kind of perverse incentives or disincentives that, that crop up. Um, within the school, uh, the, the school funding formula, I mean, I, I think what you've seen is that uh, there are winners that very clearly know that they are winners, and even if you devise a hold harmless, uh, they prefer to keep the existing system and run the dollars through that. One of the things that I was supportive of, which the governor had proposed, which was also proposed by my colleague Jeff Mursaw in separate legislation, which I co-sponsored, would have increased uh, sparsity aid to those schools that currently have been just outside, uh, would add an additional tier to kind of flatten out the formula. And that's the sort of things that we can make changes to really right now while waiting for hopefully a, a broader solution uh, to come forward, but I mean that's going to take a lot of uh, political courage in terms of how do we ultimately fix the, the school formula because we do have a formula that's based on increasing enrollment and that's not the reality now in most of Wisconsin. So it is something where I, I certainly attended the, the one in the area in terms of the Blue Ribbon Task Force, but we need to get very real with the solutions that we're proposing. and. I think we need to look at how do we fund uh, fund schools and appropriately fund districts as opposed to, uh, well, and, and also looking at things like special education that we're maybe not necessarily fully accounting for within the existing funding formula. I think, you know, there are any number of issues where, you know, government maybe picks some numbers at one point in time and those inequities get frozen and spread over time. And certainly that's one of the things that we've seen within shared revenue, which is why we haven't made additional investments in it. Thanks, Kelly. Sure. 
Yeah, I think it's very important, especially in this district, to make sure that our rural schools are adequately funded, uh, not just from a teacher salary perspective, but our facilities perspective. And we've seen the impact of the cuts to our K-12 education system. In 2016 alone, uh, Wisconsin communities uh, held $1.35 billion in local referendums to come up with uh, funding shortfalls uh, in the state. And I've seen it firsthand uh, up in uh, Door County and other areas um, where these rural schools struggle mightily um, to attract and retain teachers, to, to fund their programming, and to update their facilities. So this is a serious issue for SD1, and I want to make sure that uh, our rural schools are taken care of as adequately as other schools throughout the state. All right, thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we're getting really close to 8 o'clock, and we still have to do closing arguments. And there are plenty of other questions that people have asked, both here in person and on Facebook, but we just don't have time to get to them. Um, so we'll start with closing arguments. Andre, um, we'll start with you. Uh, you have three minutes uh, for your closing arguments. Sure. Well, actually, I was going to ask for extra time based on the, the comment of the, the cuts to schools, because that really is, I think, very false. There was, if you look at, uh, you know, my first term in office, that is maybe what is being referred to in terms of the decrease in school funding was commensurate with the amount of reduced costs as a result of Act 10. Since that time, the legislature has repeatedly increased school funding per student basis. I think it was 150 per student, then another 150 per student. This last budget, it was 200, and then 204 in the second year of the biennium. And really, those were what were stop. Oh, I'm a. I was actually allowed a rebuttal. Oh, thank you. Okay, now we'll get into my closing statement. <laughs> Thank so I just want to thank everybody again for coming out tonight. I know that events like this sometimes grab people that already have their minds made up about the, the candidates, but I think largely we've been respectful and had a, a good discussion of ideas, and uh, that's something that I want to be able to continue to have those discussions. That's something that I think I'm, I'm very proud of in my time in the legislature, is that uh, I've been accessible. I pass out probably about 15,000 Packer Badger NASCAR hunting schedules every, uh, every year, and people have never abused that. We've been able to have a lot of good conversations. Real legislation has come from those discussions. And uh, it's the sort of thing that I want to encourage people to continue that dialogue, especially when I have uh, you know, my, my town hall meetings or other opportunities for citizen involvement. Um, you know, that I, I guess uh, I just want to continue the work that we've started. And uh, I'm very pleased with the support that I've had from people, uh, you know, especially now I never thought when I was first elected that I would ever go a, an election without a Democratic opponent because I am a proud fiscal and social conservative. I didn't have a Democratic opponent either of my last two times up for re-election. And I, I guess that shows that people know that they can at least have that conversation with me. And we've been able to, I think, find common sense and, and middle ground. And it is something where you know, I've been able to work very successfully across the aisle, uh, you know, actually as a Caleb might not be happy to hear this, but you know a few of uh, my colleagues in the legislature, Democrats, uh, in both the Assembly and the Senate, were among the first folks to, to congratulate me because we have been able to work across the aisle on things like human trafficking, on things like uh, common sense environmental reforms, and it is something where you know I uh, I just appreciate opportunities like this, and uh, you know to work on things like crime victims' rights and. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I just want to say thank you to everybody that opens their door for me and we're able to have real conversations throughout this campaign. I know that's going to continue into the fall. And uh, thanks again to, uh, to the Press Gazette for affording us this forum. Thanks, Andre. Caleb? Sure. Yeah, and I'll echo that. Thank you, Press Gazette, and thank you, uh, Andre. This has been a, uh, a principles-based clashing of ideas and respectful, so uh, that's been great. Thank you guys for coming out. This is important. Uh, it's a big part of democracy. and. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to kind of share some of the insights that have, that have led to, to, to my running for office and uh, I'm really grateful that my private sector career has included uh, both finance and economic development and that both those areas have, have exposed me to diverse, diverse personalities, diverse industries, diverse geographies and uh, similarly uh, my community service whether that was you know, raising a six figure sum to send inner city schools to summer camp or bring a mentor to a young man for more than five years those experiences are what have shaped my perspectives, my priorities, and my values. And I'm really proud of the track record of accomplishment I've had in all those endeavors, 
And the reason I've been able to do that is because when your mission is above partisan rank or partisan bias, you can accomplish great things. And that's what I'm proud of in economic development, working with uh, elected officials, working with teachers, working with entrepreneurs and business owners uh, in finance with high net worth individuals and very stringent credit officers and uh, also in our community with, uh, with, with impoverished children and, and other folks as well. So those, those experiences have, have shaped me, have guided my perspectives, my priorities, and I just hope uh, for the opportunity to uh, be a proactive, collaborative, cooperative center, senator for SD1. And uh, one of my very uh, most formative and important mentors uh, very lovingly told me that, you know, we're given two ears and one mouth in proportion for a reason, uh, and I intend to legislate as such. I want to listen to my constituents uh, and understand the issues from them uh, and bring their concerns to Madison and be a strong voice for them uh, for SD1. So thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate the great turnout tonight uh, and for the great moderation, and uh, thank you very much. All right, thanks to you both. Uh, let's give them a round of applause.